Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadara, Shri Vasari Gauda Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Today we'll discuss the first verse of fourth chapter. What is the title of the fourth chapter? Transcendental knowledge. Transcendental knowledge. So we'll discuss what is transcendental knowledge and how it is disseminated to all of us and what is the benefit of knowledge that is transcendental. Krishna will be explaining. So in the third chapter, we'll do a little quiz. Chapter 3 quiz. Everyone is ready? For quiz time? No prasad unless the quiz is answered. <laughs> so Arjuna had a confusion in the beginning of the third chapter. And what was his confusion? Anybody remember? Between active and active. Between active and inactive. So Krishna said there were two paths to self-realization. Right? Two paths. One is active and one is passive or inactive. And which path did Krishna recommend? Active. 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 And why did Krishna say that you should pursue the active path of self-realization? But the soul's innate nature. Okay, so the soul's innate nature is to be active. So better we go in conjunction with the nature of the soul. One, one reason? It helps, it helps in purifying the desires if one is active, but active intelligently, right? So we'll say, when we say active path of self realization, how should we do our activity? In conjunction with Krishna, but in specifically in conjunction with Krishna, how must we do our activities? Follow the instructions. Detached. Detached. Yes, follow the instructions, which teach us Detached. detachment. Detachment from the result. Not from the work. Detachment from the result. Okay. So, Krishna is saying that you work detached active. So he said that was better. Did he say it was definitely better? Conclusively he said it was better, right? Now, one reason is because the soul is active. Two, it purifies of our desires. Because what happens if we try to be inactive before purifying from our material desires? What happens? If we try to be inactive, I try to give up all my material desires, or at least give up acting on those, but those desires are still present within me, what happens to me while I'm trying to be inactive? We'll be distracted from those desires. We'll be distracted from those desires. Yeah. We'll become frustrated. Why? Because the taste for those desires are still there. I want to do this, but I can't. I want to do this, but I can't. That is not a very enjoyable experience for anyone. Right? So Krishna says that by being active in a detached manner, one purifies from their desires. There's a second result from working in a detached manner. Anybody remember what is the second result? So one purifies from desires. And it also like leads to the path. Uh, the goal, like, the goal is achieved upon the right path. So it leads to the path. The goal is achieved. Yeah. And how does that path become clear? What manifests when we work in this attached manner? Knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge illuminates the path. Just like if you're on a road, you have lights, right? 
Lights illuminate the path or your headlights on your car. They show you where to go when the current road is turning. So acting in a detached manner, Krishna said, one, purifies us of our desires, our material desires, and two, brings about knowledge. This transcendental knowledge, though. Not just knowledge of what the weather will be like tomorrow, mm -hmm. or what is the capital of some country. No, but knowledge about transcendental science, the science of self-realization. That is what manifests from this detached action. So that is the re reason. Any other reasons why the active path of self-realization is better or recommended by Krishna than this inactive path? Hmm? The reason? Yeah, any other benefits? Self-realized path. They're both paths of self-realization, right? Krishna said, the Sankhya Yoga path is also a path of realization, which is the inactive path. And also this Bhakti, more Buddhi Yoga, but Bhakti Yoga is also a path. So, again, we said why, because one, it's active, and that's nature of the soul. It purifies, it leads to knowledge. It's easy. It's easy. Easier. Easier. And why is it easier? Based on love. Based on love. Krishna's mercy. Krishna's mercy. We get Krishna's help in the path of bhakti. Why else is it easier? We work in our own nature. We, we work in our own it, nature. It also okay. like uh, gives you uh, pleasure while and performing. Also he tells yeah. that what to be good, what to be not good. And he work under the guidance of the uh, spiritual Mm. Uh, so it it's very enjoyable because one gets to use their senses in a productive manner. Remember the higher taste. One gets to enjoy the tastes of bhakti. So it's a more enjoyable path. It's an easier path. You get the help of Krishna. It's more in line with our nature. It allows us to practice before we have fully purified of our desires. Right? Imagine if we had to, we could only begin bhakti if after becoming free of all our desires. How we can become free of our desires? Only by the practice of bhakti. So this active path is being highly recommended by Krishna. Okay? Now, the difficult part of this active path is what's the most difficult part of the active path initially for us? Detaching from the results. Detaching from the results. So Krishna spoke in the third chapter why we should detach from the results. What is a single it's, uh, reason? Uh, it will cause misery, uh, bondage. By not yeah. detaching, by attaching to the result, it will cause misery. misery. Future reactions, more birth, more death, more old age, and more disease. That is what binds us to the material world. As long as we are in the material world and not on the path of Krishna consciousness, we're going to be thrown into the cycle of birth, death, old age, and disease. And Krishna will speak later from the highest planet to the lowest is full of Misery. That is Krishna's statement. Full of misery. But as soon as one comes to bhakti, whether you're on the highest planet or the lowest planet, one becomes prasanatma. Very happy. So, the detachment is difficult. But we should detach because it creates bondage. Why else should we detach from the fruits of our work? Krishna makes a very important statement in this third chapter, a very famous verse. We are not the doer. He says, Prakute kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvasha 
अहंकारादिदाते that you are not the doer you are not the creator of the result so then you are not the rightful owner of the result our ego leads us to think i am the doer i am making these things i am going to the office i am doing this but in reality everything we are doing we are dependent on krishna and remember krishna gave those two verses in the third chapter where he said everyone subsists on food grains and food grains come from rains and rains come from from the pledge pleasing of the they the yagyas and yagyas come from prescribed duties prescribed duties and so on <coughs> not quite the exact order i just spoke but it said that even a single grain of food ultimately comes from the krishna so one who enjoys the material world without yagya sacrifice to krishna what did krishna call that person thief a thief just like if i come into your home and enjoy the facilities of your home thinking i am the doer then i am a thief i must take your permission your blessings so krishna said you detach from the fruits it should not be so difficult they're not yours to begin with but our ego leads us to believe so he smashed our ego he says you are not the doer only the material nature is the doer so now krishna has explained that by doing this in an active path excuse me one purifies from desires and one acquires knowledge right knowledge so this chapter or chapter 4 is in title transcendental knowledge now how to get this knowledge krishna is going to speak what is this knowledge krishna is going to speak and what is the result of this knowledge this knowledge is only beneficial if it has some value some benefit to us otherwise it's just interesting but knowledge is important if it has some value so krishna is going to now speak so if if we step back now and look at where we are from karma kanda to bhakti one increases in knowledge right so in the karma kanda process what is one doing what is the what is karma kanda process to your actions regulated regulated or been regulated um from vedas yeah so regulated sense enjoyment do your actions according to the vedas and what is the goal of such action uh, enjoyment okay. some sense enjoyment right so i have some knowledge that there's a higher power i'm not my independent door thus i'm going to do some yagya but my goal of such yagya is enhanced sense gratification i would like to have lots of wealth lots of children big promotion maybe even go to the heavenly planets and fly in celestial airplanes so i have knowledge of sense gratification and i have knowledge of some higher cause i don't know who is the source of everything yet but i have some you all have knowledge now is this the best we can achieve why because those are temporary it's all temporary it's very limited even the enjoyment in the heavenly planet still there is stress fear anxiety death old age disease how we know because we've acquired some knowledge So now if you go from karma kanda to karma yoga that was the last chapter karma yoga what does one do you do the without uh, getting attached to the result they do their duty detached from the result 
they have a now transcendental objective. The objective is not to enjoy in the material world, but the objective is to transcend. To get beyond, transcend means to go above. Okay? We want to go above the material world. So there's some knowledge that there is a higher power and knowledge of this transcendental goal. Is there knowledge of Krishna yet? No. no. Not yet. Now as one goes from karma yoga to jnana yoga, one acquires more knowledge. <coughs> what knowledge is there in jnana yoga? Uh, knowledge about Krishna. Not yet. Not yet. I am not this body. There is a knowledge, a distinction between spirit and matter. Right? I am not this body, matter, I am spirit. But what is missing in this knowledge? Supreme. What is my relationship? Yeah. What is my spirit? Where does my spirit come from? Where does my spirit belong? What is the nature of my spirit? I know I'm spirit, but I don't know what it is. Then knowledge brings us to, further knowledge brings us to bhakti. Which means, I know I'm not this body, I know I'm spirit soul, and who am I? Part and parcel, Part and parcel of Krishna. And what is my sanatan dharma? Serving Servant to Krishna. So you see how we progress. Knowledge increases. I learn more and more. And from bhakti, where do we go then? To Krishna. That is it. Bhakti is the top. That when one knows Krishna, one knows everything. He is the root cause. The source of everything. If you know the source of everything, you know everything thereafter. So transcendental knowledge culminates, concludes in knowing Krishna. So this chapter is going to t talk to us about this important topic of transcendental knowledge. Because it requires knowledge to progress. And remember, ultimately Krishna is going to say, you start at bhakti. You don't need to go through the step-by-step -step process. Okay? So now let's see. In the first four verses of this chapter, Krishna is describing how this knowledge comes and the nature of this knowledge. So we'll read the first verse. Someone wants to read? <laughs> The person of your Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna said, I instructed this interchangeable kind of yoga to the sun god, Vivaswam, and Vivaswam instructed to Manu, the father of mankind, and Manu in turn instructed it to Ikshaka. Report? <coughs> Herein we find the history of the Bhagavad Gita takes from a remote time when it was delivered to the royal order of all planets, beginning from the sun planet. The kings of all planets are especially meant for the protection of the inhabitants, and therefore the royal order should understand the science of Bhagavad Gita in order to be able to rule the citizens and protect them from material bondage to lust. Human life is meant for cultivation of spiritual knowledge in eternal relationship with the Supreme Person of your Godhead, and the executive heads of all states and all planets are obliged to impart these lessons to the citizens by education, culture, and devotion. In other words, the executive heads of all the states are intent to spread <coughs> the science of Krishna conscious to the, so that the people may take advantage of this great science and pursue a successful path, utilizing the opportunity of the human form of life. In this millennium, the sun god is known as Vivaswam, the king of the sun, which is the vertinal of the planets within the solar system. In the Brahma Samhita, it is stated, Vastrakur Esa Savitra, Sakala, Sakala Grahana, 
cada conducta se va a unir al queso que desea. Ese, ese gnaya, ganpati, samhita, kala, chakra, govindam, adi, purushan, tamaham, bajami. Let me worship Lord Brahma said, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Govinda, who is the virtual person and under whose order the sun reaches the king of all planets, is the human immense power and feet. The sun represents the eye of the Lord and traverses its orbit in obedience to his order. The sun is the king of the planets and the sun god, representative of the name of Vedaswan, who is the sun planet, which is the controlling all other planets by supplying <coughs> the heat and light. He is rotating under the order of Krishna, and Lord Krishna originally made Vedaswan his first disciple to understand the signs of Bhagavad Gita. The Gita is now therefore a speculative treatise for the insignificant mundane scholar, but it is a standard book of knowledge coming down from time immemorial. In the Mahabharata, Shanti Parva, 348.51-52, we can trace out the history of the Gita as follows. Treta Yugadav Chatato, Vivaswan Manave Pradav, Manushcha Loka Prithyardam, Sutay Chatavan Dadav, Ushwakunacha Kadito, Yapalo Lokan Avastita. In the beginning of the millennium, known as Treta Yuga, the signs of the relationship with the Supreme was delivered by Vivaswan to Manu. Manu, being the father of mankind, gave it to his son, Maharaja Ushwaku, the king of the earth planet and forefather of the Prabhu dynasty in which Lord Ramachandra appeared. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita existed in human society from the time of Maharaja Ishwaku. At the present moment, we have just passed through the 5,000 years of Kaliyuga, which lasted 4,32,000 years. Before this, there was Dwapara Yuga, 8 lakh years, and before that, the Treta Yuga, 12 lakh years. Thus, some <coughs> 20 lakh 5,000 years ago, Manu spoke the Bhagavad Gita to his disciple and son Maharaja Ikshwaku, the king of this planet Earth. The age of the current Manu is calculated to last him 30 crores 53 lakh years, of which 12 crores 14 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 the Gita was spoken to the Lord to his disciple, the son God, Vivaswan. A rough estimate is that the Gita was spoken at least uh, 12 crore or 40,000 years ago, and in human society it has been extinct for 2 million years. It was re spoken to the Lord again to Arjuna about 5,000 years ago. There is a rough estimate of the history of Gita according to the Gita itself and according to the version of the speaker, Lord Sri Krishna. It was spoken to the sun god Vivaswan because he is also Kshatriya and is the father of all Kshatriyas who are descendants, descendants of the sun god or the Surya Vamsa Kshatriyas. Because Bhagavad Gita is as good as the Vedas, being spoken to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, this knowledge is Apaurusheya, superhuman. Since the Vedic instructions are accepted as they are, without human interpretation, the Gita must therefore be accepted without mundane interpretation. The mundane ramblers may speculate on the Gita in their own ways, but that is not Bhagavad Gita as it is. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita has to be accepted as it is from the Vitaplex succession, and it is described herein that the Lord spoke to the Sun God, the Sun God spoke to, the, to his son Manu, and Manu spoke to his son Ikshwaku. Okay. <coughs> so, again, Krishna is establishing this transcendental knowledge now. This, the sum and substance of this knowledge is going to be that Krishna is going to say, by understanding this, one can become free from all misery. One can achieve liberation and go back home to God. That is the conclusion of this knowledge. But now, we first have to understand where this knowledge comes from. So why do you think Krishna is describing the history of this knowledge. Any any guesses, ideas? Why is Krishna speaking? I spoke to Vivaswan, Vivaswan gave to Manu, Manu gave to Kshaku, and this, so on and so forth. What is coming the, as it is without deliberation. It's coming as it is without deliberation, but I could argue that 
And actually that point will be coming in the next verse. Krishna is going to establish this parampara. But Krishna himself is speaking. He is the source of all knowledge. He wants to uh, let Arjuna know this is not the first time it's been. Uh, it, uh, it is, uh, the knowledge is going to be same throughout the life. Like no matter what, what time or period it is. And what is the importance of understanding that this knowledge what is, has been going on for millions of years? We can say since time immemorial. But what is the relevance for us? In understanding that, you're right. It is uh, it is valid at any given time. Yes, it is useful. Because if we understood that this Bhagavad Gita was spoken five thousand years ago to Arjuna on a battlefield, right? What is one doubt that will come into our mind? Is it relevant right now? Is it relevant today? Right. Is it still relevant? Well, back then, there was this going on and that going on, and we we're only on iPhone 1 and this and that. So today, we need modern knowledge. We need to adapt this knowledge to today's time. Right? That logic, bad logic, but that logic can manifest in our heart. So Krishna is saying that this knowledge, how old it is? Millions. Millions. We cannot trace back to its actual origin. He is giving just a relative understanding of millions of years old. Okay. So, the knowledge of how to bring about peace and happiness to the soul, this, we can say, is the oldest knowledge and also the latest and greatest technology. Why is the latest and greatest technology? Yeah. It's millions of years old. How I can say it's the latest and greatest technology? Well, they're spirit souls. They're spirit souls. Which is eternal. And this knowledge is also eternal. So it is always latest for the soul. So the knowledge is relevant, though it is old, because one thing never changes. What is it that doesn't change? Soul and the... Soul and the... Supreme Soul. The relationship between the soul and Krishna never changes. Times may change, fashions may change, cultures may change, borders of the country may change, political leaders may change. But what doesn't change? My relationship with Krishna. And so the knowledge <laughs> about that doesn't change. And why is it still the latest and greatest technology? Because it gives the science behind the existence. It gives the science behind the existence. But why is it the greatest? Uh, it also uh, provides information on how to live your life. Provides and, information. And, uh, uh, and, and your have to find perfection or happiness, which no other technology can provide. It provides the greatest result. No other knowledge can provide this result, which is a life of happiness and peace. So thus, it's still the latest technology, though it's millions and millions and millions of years old. Nothing that has come since can give this answer, how to find peace and happiness. And that's why Prabhupada said this knowledge is aparishya. It is infallible. So Krishna is establishing that this knowledge is eternally relevant. Because the nature of the soul with Krishna is eternal. That position of me being part and parcel and eternal servant of Krishna doesn't change. So the knowledge of how to understand that relationship, how to awaken that relationship, how to act in that relationship, that also doesn't change. So the relevance of studying Bhagavad Gita today is as relevant as it was millions of years ago. 
and it will remain relevant for the rest of time because it doesn't change. So to help us have some faith in this knowledge in its application to us today. This knowledge has no value unless we apply it. And what does it mean to apply this knowledge? Hmm? Practice it. Yeah, we have to do it. Right? We have to apply it and practice it in our day-to-day -day life. Then it has value. I can have knowledge that going to the gym is good for me. But that knowledge has no value unless I go to the gym and exercise the body. I can have knowledge that I am part and parcel of Krishna. I am not this body. But unless I act in that knowledge, vigyan, it doesn't have any value. So this transcendental knowledge, we have to apply. And our faith in applying it can increase if we understand it is still the only knowledge that we can apply to our day-to-day -day life today that can bring about perfection of life. It is still relevant. So let us not be foolish thinking, oh, 5,000 years ago it was relevant, but today it doesn't, it's not practical. No, it is extraordinarily practical. And that's why we gather like this and we discuss how to practice it. How to bring it into our day-to-day -day life. Because otherwise, knowledge is just interesting, facts, but won't have real value. And we have to be careful in our own study that sometimes we get into the habit of studying and studying and studying and studying. But what do we forget to do? Practice. Applying it. So each time we approach the Bhagavad Gita, we should think, what is the practical thing I can apply in my day-to-day -day life? Then we'll make progress. Okay. So now, Krishna, uh, Prabhupada is commenting that the kings of the planet are especially meant for, what is the role of the kings or rulers of the planet? To take care of the citizens. To, for, yeah, and he says protect the citizens, right? To take care of the citizens. In this human form of life, what is our only duty? You can say, wow, I have so many duties. How I can pick one? <laughs> <laughs> to serve the Lord. To serve the Lord. I must inquire because I have intelligence. The tree cannot ask, who am I? Where am I going? The squirrel cannot ask. Why is the um, world full of suffering? Why good things are happening to bad people? And why bad things are happening to good people? Like this. But who can inquire? The human form of life. So the great kings who are protecting society, what is their responsibility? The responsibility is given here. To provide to knowledge, them from material knowledge. bondage to lust. To protect them from material bondage. Such a foreign concept because today, are any leaders in society protecting us from, for, from material bondage and lust? In fact, what are they trying to do? Bring the opposite. Increase it. <clears throat> But the real responsibility of the rulers, <coughs> if they want to protect society, <coughs> is to help them get out. So the great kings had a response, have a responsibility still today, though no one none are performing. But in the past, we see the great kings would propagate this knowledge would make it available, would create society in a way that this knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita could be practiced and encouraged. Yet, what do governments do? 
You cannot teach this knowledge in schools. So backwards has come our ruling society that now they have banned this knowledge. The only knowledge that can give real happiness and protection, they have banned. Such is the time of Kali Yuga. But the rulers have a responsibility. And actually, in the Shastra it explains that all of the sinful activities of society, 6% accrues to the king. And all of the good, 6% accrues to the king. So the king is at a vested interest in making sure society behaved. But today such knowledge is lost. But that fact remains. So anybody want to be President of the United States? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Unless you can bring such knowledge to the state. So this very important responsibility takes advantage, is, is important. And Prabhupada writes that the executive heads of all state are intended to spread the science of Krishna consciousness so that people may take advantage of this great science and pursue a successful path, utilizing the opportunity in the human form of life. Otherwise, all we are doing is eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. We are living an animal life. Unless we use this intelligence, so the great kings are responsible for making this possible. And for each of us, we have a responsibility. But unfortunately, that time is no longer present uh, where the Rajarshis, the saintly kings, are bringing this knowledge about. So we have to pursue it ourselves. Right? Now, just one final comments, or a few final comments here. In the last paragraph, Prabhupada is making, you know, putting a timeline together here. So, one thing we see here is that in the two paragraphs prior, the sun is the king of the planets and the sun god at the present of the name Vivasvan. Which also gives us some indication. Right? Sun god is a post. It is occupied by different persons. Currently, it's Vivaswan. And the Manu, who rules, is also a post. Currently, anyone knows the name of current Manu? Huh? Vaivasvata Manu. And each Manu rules for 71 cycles of the Yugas. Meaning one Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dwapar Yuga, and Kali Yuga. 4,320,000 years. That is one cycle. 71 such cycles is the rule of one Manu. And what cycle number are we in of Vaivasvata Manu? 28. So 28 cycle of the 71 of Vaivasvata Manu. And within the day of Manu, um, so the day of Brahma, there are, are a total of 14 Manus. 14 Manus. And Vaivasvata Manu is the seventh Manu. So we are in the middle of the day of Brahma. And the 28th cycle. And why this is all relevant? Because in the Reign of Vaivasata Manu in the 28th cycle at the end of Dwapar Yuga, Krishna appears. Only in this Dwapar Yuga, in the day of Brahma. So, of the 14 Manus, Krishna only appears in the Manu of Vaivasata Manu. And within Vaivasata Manu, how many Dwapar Yugas are? 71. Because there are 71 cycles. And only in this specific Dhapar Yuga. And after Krishna appears, who appears? 
So we are very fortunate to be receiving this knowledge because you can see it was respoken how long ago? 5,000 years. Now, when did um, Manu speak to Vivasvan? 120 million years ago. So we can see how fortunate we are that this Bhagavad Gita was respoken relatively recently. Still, you can go to Kurukshetra and see the spot in which Krishna spoke to Arjuna. But if it was only spoken 120 million years ago, we'd have no hope. But because it was spoken so recently in relative time frame, we are very, very fortunate. But if we don't take advantage of this fortune and start to apply this knowledge today, who knows how many more millions of lifetimes we will be cycling through and when we may again come in contact with this supreme science. So unless we appreciate the nature of this knowledge, our application will not be so sincere. So for that, Krishna is giving a little bit of history. And next week, we'll discuss this very important verse, Evam Palam Para Praptem Imam Narjar Siddhi Duhu Sakale Neha Mahata Yoga Nashta Parantapa That how this knowledge comes into succession. How if it's millions of years old, we are still getting it in its original form without any changes and how we can be absolutely certain of it. So that we'll discuss uh, in the coming verses. Okay. Any questions or comments? Well, once you said this is greatest because um, it is spoken by Krishna directly because the knowledge we there is no shortage of knowledge. So by claiming, I realize this, I realize this. But this is greatest because it is told by Krishna. Mm -hmm. So this is my comment though. I, I recall from your <laughs> class. Because Krishna is all-knowing. All-knowing is means they have complete knowledge. We're not all-knowing. We think we are all-knowing. But we are so foolish that we don't even know what is happening one floor below us. Forget it. I am staring at you and I don't even know what is going on in your mind. <laughs> I can see your face, I can see your face. Still I don't know. Forget about that. I don't even know what's going on in my own body. I don't know how the blood is being pumped through my... Yeah, science was... I still don't really know how the oxygen is being delivered to the brain and how the neurons are firing so my hand can move like this. I don't know anything. Yet, I want to know who is God and how the universe was created and how I was created. I will figure it out through my own knowledge. But I cannot even figure out how my fingernail is growing on my finger. I, I don't know. But I can tell you, based on my understanding, who is God. That is our foolish nature. We don't know anything. But thankfully, Krishna knows everything. And thankfully, Krishna delivers this knowledge to those who want to know it. And thankfully, this knowledge has very simple applications for us. We just have to find it from the source. And make sure, because you don't know how your fingernails grow, and I don't know how, and, and nobody else does, the knowledge we get doesn't come from someone. It has to come from the Supreme One. Krishna. And he's going to discuss next week, how that knowledge from Krishna comes to us. Because one may say, well, Arjuna was lucky. Krishna was speaking to him. Well, we are also lucky. 
Because Krishna is speaking to us. How? Through? Evam parampara. Bhakti. Through parampara. They know even Krishna now. Krishna is the God and things like that. And with what is that bhakti which you're speaking? This mm. is the pinnacle of the last yogi process. So karma kanda process are not doing bhakti. So we have to make sure we don't, you know, it's they're not when you're doing karma kanda, my goal is sense gratification. That is not bhakti. Having Krishna on an altar doesn't make it bhakti. Bhakti is patram pushpam phalam toyam yome bhakti aparyachati. That is bhakti. Bhakti is love of Krishna. Bhakti means love. And the only one to love is Krishna. So bhakti means that I am serving Krishna in a mood of love for his pleasure. No self motive. Anya bilashita shunyam genakamari navatam anukuli ina krishna anushilanam bhakti uttama. This is bhakti. No desires. That is the ultimate of all results. Because when one serves Krishna with love, with no desire, not even desire for their own self-preservation, meaning their own safety, their own happiness, their own peace, no desires. When one serves Krishna in that mood, one automatically achieves the protection of the Lord, supreme happiness, more than one can even calculate in their own feeble minds. But you're bringing a very important point that we mix so many things and call it bhakti. That we have to be very careful. Krishna says, Man mana bhava mad bhakto majri maam namaskuru. Bhakti is these four things. Becoming my devotee. Thinking of me. Offering your homages to me. Offering obeisances to me. That is bhakti. Right? So bhakti isn't spirit, just any spirituality. Bhakti is the worship of Krishna for his pleasure. That is bhakti. If I have a picture of Krishna and I'm ringing a bell and I'm offering a gilam, that may or may not be bhakti. If I'm worshipping Krishna, thinking him to be some devata, then I don't have knowledge of who is Krishna. And he says, fools deride me when I appear in my human form. They don't know who I am. So we have to know who is Krishna. Krishna is going to say in nine verses coming, Janma karma chame deviyam evam yo veti tattvataha. He says, one who knows me, the nature of my janma and karma, my appearance and activities, that person is eligible for liberation. Most people don't understand this. So bhakti must be knowledge of who is Krishna and the action in that knowledge. So don't become misconstrued. You can see this so much things going on, I think, oh, this is bhakti. Bhakti is loving service to Krishna for his pleasure. That is bhakti. Make sense? Yes, sir. Another question is, the knowledge, knowledge of Krishna means what? You know? Because in these verses of what we are reading is helping us to behave ourselves in this human life. Yeah. What is what Krishna like? What is pleasure to him? How do you know? What is pleasurable to Krishna? You think? 
<coughs> How do we even know that? The fact that you're asking that question in and of itself is very intelligent because it helps us understand that we don't know. We don't know how to please Krishna. We don't know who he is. We don't know how we should react. If Krishna walked through this door, what we would do? So how to find out? We have to find out from those who know. Right? So Krishna is going to say in the coming verses, what's he going to say? Hmm? Know it from You must? One must take shelter of a guru and find out why? Because Tattva Darshinaha, they have had darshan of Krishna. They know Krishna. So then they can impart that truth to you. Tadvidi, this vidhi must get from Guru. Because we don't know. But he knows. And that knowledge can then become imparted upon us. So it's a very important question. What to know about Krishna? Krishna is going to say he is inconceivable. Inconceivable means I cannot know him. He is unknowable, he says. Wait a minute. If he's inconceivable and unknowable, how will I know him? You, we can know only a tiny glimpse of him. Because he's unlimited. But how to bring about that? We have to follow the process. Bhakti. Jaitanya Mahaprabhu came and he instructed Rupa Goswami on how to practice bhakti. And then he said, you write it. And he wrote in the form of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. It's a great book. It is a law book of bhakti. How to do bhakti. What to do. What our mindset should be, how that knowledge comes, what are the prerequisites, qualifications, all this detail is given. Because right? otherwise, I may think bhakti is this, you may think bhakti is that. Doesn't matter what you think or I think. What matters is what Krishna thinks. And he is given in Shastra how to do bhakti. So many people say, oh, bhakti is individual. It's an individual expression. Bhakti is individual with Krishna. That is true. But the process to bring out that expression requires training. And the training process is given by Krishna. So, what do you know about Krishna? Krishna is going to explain in these coming verses. How he is different from us. Arjuna is going to ask, wait a minute, how you told Manu? And Krishna is going to say, I remember the past, but you do not. And he's going to create the distinction between him and us. He appears when he wants to appear. Any of you picked your birthday? <laughs> Any of you picked which home you'll be born in? No. Krishna does. Any of you get to pick how fast your body will age? If you did, we'd all be early youth. <laughs> but Krishna does. So his birth, his appearance, his activities are very different from ours. Right? So that knowledge of Krishna will bring us to understand, render service to him. And as we render service to him, we'll learn more and more about Krishna. Okay. You have a question for me? One more thing. Yes. Yeah. One second. He probably has a question. Then we oh, can... sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, probably, uh, just a while ago, you said, like, you know, like, who's, uh, who still thinks me as uh, not a human, not as God? But isn't the fools are, like, you know, like, 
taken away from this transcendental knowledge. Uh, that's why they are fools now. And it, that's also like based on, like they have, they made fools not, like I, I don't know, like Krishna, uh, Krishna could control that, right? Like whether they are fools or not fools, like it's all like his. It's not his control because remember he is responding to our desire. So if I don't want to know Krishna, Krishna will enable us to become foolish. So Krishna will not force us to be foolish or to not know him. So if I have, I don't want to know Krishna because if I know Krishna then he is the boss and I am secondary. I want to be the boss. I want to be. Then Krishna will cover our knowledge. So those who saw, even in the Mahabharata, right? Shishupal didn't know who was Krishna. <coughs> and he kept insulting, kept insulting. So many people, they didn't know, even though they are right associating with him. So Krishna reveals himself to his devotees. To others, he keeps covered. Why? Because they don't want to see Krishna. So Krishna is equally kind to those who don't like him either. He says, if you don't want to know me, I will remain hidden from you. But also, if you want to know me, I will remain in your presence. So it's up to us. But he doesn't force it upon us. He doesn't make us foolish. We make ourselves foolish. So the process now is to acknowledge, Krishna, I am a fool. Please help me become unfoolish. But if I think, no, I have this big, big degree, I'm not a fool, I know everything. <laughs> Krishna will say, okay. I'm not forced. It's okay. Do you have another question? Two listeners here, Prabhupada says, mundane wranglers may speculate. <laughs> what is the mundane wrangler? Where, where are you looking just so I can get the context? Just what the page? Last Oh, mundane wranglers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know what a snake wrangler is? Someone who will like try to control and you know play with the snake. They're called the snake wranglers. Or they have like in rodeos, cowboys. They you know wrestle. So mundane wranglers, that you know people speculate on the Bhagavad Gita, right? They try to manipulate and contort this message into all kinds of things. This is Bhagavad Gita. How many versions of Bhagavad Gita are out there? Hundreds. And they contort the message to achieve some other goal. So the you cannot speculate on what Krishna was trying to say in Bhagavad Gita. We can only take it as it is. And thus Prabhupada has presented Bhagavad Gita as it is. With the original Sanskrit, word for word, purport. Sorry, translation purport. Because it has to come as it is. And the commentary on Bhagavad Gita has to come from Parampara. All of Prabhupada's purports are built from the commentaries of Srila Baladev Vidya Bhushan and Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur. Two great acharyas in our parampara. So otherwise we'll speculate. I think Krishna meant this. I can speculate on why Krishna spoke this verse. I instructed this to Imperial Science Sangha. He's trying to show how great he is. That's why he must be doing it. I could speculate as such. So the Bhagavad Gita is not meant to speculate. It must come in parampara. It must come in disciplic succession. And that's the point he's going to make in the next verse. That we cannot try to guess as to what the purport is. I was recently in a library and I saw there were like eight to ten different versions of Bhagavad Gita. And I opened up, you know, a couple of them and looked into some of the famous verses. And I was shocked. I mean, I was just shocked at the translations. It was scary, actually. 
But then two of them had the exact same, or virtually exact same, at least maybe one word different, but the, the, you know, the essence was the same. I was shocked at these other ones, how bad they were contorted. That's what this is. Shilaprabhupada ki, Jai Hanta Koti Vaishnavinda ki, Jai Hare Krishna.